This is AEDT 2150U, Digital Technologies and Advanced Teaching Methods. In the series of video capsules, Dr. Davidson invites Dr. François Desjardins and Dr. Claude Lamontagne to discuss constructivist teaching and constructivist learning. The analysis questions for these video capsules are as follows. For a constructivist, what is the essence of learning? Viewed from the constructivist lens, is there such a thing as teaching? How do we know if our students really learn something from our teaching? And do you have some advice for course designers who want to prepare constructivist learning experiences? When I enter class, my conviction, well, I don't prepare classes anymore. I never prepare them really, but now it's explicit in my, in my planning or non-planning. I prepare myself for class, I don't prepare classes. It has reached the point where I think that profs who prepare courses, reading the book, looking at what chapters they'll cover, don't know how to teach. I enter class to react to students. I don't enter class to fill buckets, getting back to the bucket theory of knowledge. So when I enter class, my first goal is to get them to speak. Now, of course, I have an understanding of what this class is about. When I teach the history of psychology, it's what's at the core of the history of psychology. There are two or three things only that are at the heart of the history of philosophy, uh, the history of psychology. There are two or three things that are at the heart of the problem of sensory perception. I obviously have these things in mind. I know what kind of insights I'd like them to have. So, essentially what I do is very simple. I enter class and I ask them to comment to say something about perception, about their reaction to something the week before, to whatever, whatever it is that they associate in their minds to sensory perception for the perception class or to the history of psychology for the history of psychology class, I ask them, tell me something that you believe has got some truth, anything. And my hunch, and it happens, is that they will say something that has problems with it, because they're students. They have not thought about it for so many years. Even a new prof who has a PhD experience has got three, four, five years ahead of them thinking about what they are teaching, hopefully. So he has an edge. The prof has an edge. So you enter class with your edge. You get the students to talk. And as soon as they start talking, then you have some access to their current knowledge. Some access. This might not be part of a very organized or articulate theory you have about what the novice in your discipline is like. But it gives you a hunch as an intelligent person. Now, in whatever the students say, then you start thinking and it's where it's difficult. You have to find a lever of some kind, a question. You start trying to formulate a question that will hopefully make the student start doubting what, you ju what they just said is something that they think is true in the topic. So, essentially what you're trying to do, and you do that repeatedly, once you have reacted to whatever the student said in the form of a question, an answer should come back. And you do the same thing with the answer that pops up. It could be from another student. So, a classroom for a constructivist teacher is a discussion. You have no choice. No discussion, no learning. Discussion, the word discussing, means to break up, to explode, to, to break whatever is proposed by the people who are into the discussion. So I now believe that constructivists have no choice. They have to discuss with the students. The, dis the students cannot remain silent. A class where the students are silent is a class where there's no learning and where there's no teaching. It's as simple as that. I will agree about 150% of that, but maybe express it slightly differently. Um, when I enter class, which is a bit of a misnomer because I don't have a classroom, uh, I teach online like most of this course is going to occur, um, I make a few assumptions which I quickly refute. Um, and 
the idea is, is that uh, uh, the, the only assumption that I, that I, that I originally end up uh, keeping is that the students um, think they know, like I do, like we all do, about something. They think that what they know is consistent, cohesive, and that it works. Because they believe that what they have fits. Uh, and in the same way as you go with the whole eyes into being windows to the outside world and showing them that that is impossible, what you're actually showing them is that there's an inconsistency in what they think they know. And, and I think that that's critical. And, and, and I try to start with that kind, same kind of thing, uh, teaching radically different courses, but um, I have them express what they think they know. And then come up with, and that's when you talk about how do you prepare a course, prepare one question. One question that I will be fairly certain will force the students to come face to face with an inconsistency in what they think they know. And I think that's critical. Um, and because I teach in education, because of the grad courses I teach, for example, uh, tend to involve people who have uh, a fair amount of experience in teaching and so on and so forth. And I also am fairly confident that somewhere along the line, that many of them will have the same kind of, or will make the same kind of assumption that, sorry, but you and I do very often when we turn to the bucket theory of knowledge and we lecture to our students every once in a while, we'd still do that once in a while. And, and I call that the teacher fetal position. You know, lecture and then they'll do the same. Um, but I try to bring them to, to, to understand where lecture came from. So the whole idea of the pre-book, you know, having to read faire la lecture, and then people would transcribe, and then they would memorize the things factoids, and therefore they would have learned something. Um, and then I sort of like try to bring them to start thinking, well, if that what is learning, I try to find a question that will illustrate what the problem with that is. And I said, well, okay, if, if, if you're what you're supposed to be teaching um, now in a classroom, is accessible by all the other digital means that we have. That knowledge is available everywhere, at your fingertips. You grab your phone, you Google it. You know, ask whatever, ask whoever, contact whoever, Skype with them if you want to. You can go get the answers to those factoids, to fa factoid type questions, anywhere you want at any time. So then what is the role of the teacher? So I try to bring them to understand that the role of the teacher can no longer be what it used to be, because it used to be that way, because information was not available from anywhere else except from the teacher. Now the information is available from anywhere except from the teacher. Actually, you can get probably more up-to-date information anywhere. Don't ask the teacher. He's the last one that will have the up-to-date information. So then what's the role of the teacher? What is teaching if, 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 if what is teaching to modern technology if the lecture was to the pre-book, pre-Gutenberg uh, um, kind of, of, of arena? Um, and by throwing that kind of a question, it's like you're opening your eyes and, and you think you've got light going to the brain, but it's not the case. So you, you bring them face to face with the problem and then you plan that question. And to me, if you're going to plan any kind of constructivist perspective kind of teaching, it's making them realize that there's an inconsistency, in other words, bring to light the problem, then plan a question. Not a question that's a yes no answer, but a question that will, that will force them to do exactly what you said, and I think that's the most critical, important piece of the whole bit, is bring them to a discussion where they will have to actually build the answer to that question. It's not something that they can just go get somewhere. They have to build it. They have to build it amongst themselves, with you. It's in that process of discussion. That, that will force them to rethink their assumptions and will challenge the, their assumptions and will challenge them to maybe build something different because the inconsistency that they found in, I open my eyes, no light is getting to the brain, or, uh, well, if they can get information everywhere, what the heck am I doing giving them information in the classroom? Um, by bringing those kinds of inconsistent, in, inconsistencies to light, asking them the question, then discussing them, then they're reflecting on these things in the discussion, then that learning, ergo that construction of new knowledge, can occur. So how do you plan for, for constructivist teaching? I think it's, it's really easy, but it's most difficult. I think the most difficult piece of all of this is not the planning. And if you're talking about, you know, what do we do about the, all these instructional designers and so on and so forth, the problem is you, there's one thing that you cannot design for. There's one thing that you cannot plan for. And that, that personally, I don't know about you, but I found that only came with 
a lot of time. I won't say experience, but I'll say a lot of time in the classroom. And that's gaining the self-confidence to be able to be ready to face any of the questions they may ask. And to worse than that, be ready to not answer those questions, but being able to on a dime revert and return the questions back to them, but in such a manner that it's not just bouncing it back and hope the heck it doesn't come back to you, but bouncing it back in a way that will foster them to make that extra step forward. You know, the students in university, they learn. But it's an autodidact. What's autodidact in English? Self -learning. Self -learning. It's a self-learning environment in as much as the people stay away from the constructivist perspective. The learner has to do all the job. The prof is of no help. The student constructs. Now, I think there are ways in which the teacher can help a lot more realizing that constructivism is the only way and acting in the sense of the constructivist uh, principles. The synthesis questions for this series are What is learning for a constructivist? What principles should a constructivist course designer adopt when preparing learning activities? How can we design to ensure that all learners gain something from the experience? And what can we infer about constructivist teaching from what constructivist learning is?